Hello and welcome to this video. On this video I'm going to be ranking the guitar solos of John McLaughlin. Um, not just ranking them but I will be ranking his electric guitar solos. I'm going to leave his acoustic guitar solos for another day. When I was very young I got into heavy metal and uh, when my dad discovered I was listening to bands like Rainbow and White Snake and UFO and Diamond Head and all those sort of bands I got into when I was about the age of 12, my dad said, you should check a guitarist out called Jimi Hendrix. And I did. And uh, I heard um, quite a few things, but the track that blew me away was Voodoo Charl. On that, on that tune, Jimmy was playing the guitar that seemed to be at once spiritual and searching, but also a primal scream that went back to the blues and went back to that the sort of inner turmoil that I think I was feeling at that time as a somebody going into my teenage years. There was something in that guitar solo that represented something about me. Um, I went searching for other guitarists that would do that to me and, and there were very few sometimes Carlos Santana could you know get to that point you know every now and then but um, I then read about the guitarist John McLaughlin and uh, I went out and bought Birds of Fire and when I heard his guitar solo that seemed to be the first guitarist I'd ever heard that seemed to go beyond Jimi Hendrix into an area that really was pulling together the spirituality and the uh, the spiritual and this sort of inner turmoil torment. I'd never heard John Coltrane, and of course John Coltrane for me really embodies that approach to soloing. So these solos um, are going to be the solos that tend to take to that point. There's incredible virtuoso solos out there by John McLaughlin, but these are the ones for me that represent that thing that I heard with Jimi Hendrix so that that's the sort of parameters I'm working on with this and I'm, I've done that because I assume if you're a fan of John McLaughlin's electric guitar solos and you really want to hear that the same as me then this video might be quite interesting to point you in the direction of a few solos that you might not know okay so I'm going to start at number 10 and at number 10 I've actually got a solo that isn't quite in that genre um, it's the genre of John being funky right John came up in the 60s in in the London scene he was blaming people like Graham Bond and Brian Auger and there was a very strong rhythm and blues and soul and funk aspect and one of the things that never gets mentioned about John McLaughlin is his incredible funk guitar player the funk really emerges here with the second Mavish Norkshire with Nardo Michael Walden on drums um, now in 1978, he made an album called Electric Guitarist. And on there's a track uh, called Are You The One. It's actually called Are You The One, Are You The One. It's named twice, like New York, New York. And um, on that is uh, John McLaughlin on guitar, Tony Williams on drums, and Jack Bruce on bass. Now, this was the sort of bringing together of the latter stage of Tony Williams' lifetime. Tony Williams' lifetime was a groundbreaking fusion band that fusion <laughs> fusion band that emerged around about 1969. It featured John McLaughlin on guitar, Tony Williams on drums and Larry Young on bass. Uh, sorry, on Hammond organ. And then when they got to the second album turn it over, they brought in Jack Bruce on bass. Uh, th this was a group that really wasn't properly recorded and I think had the potential to be to have taken music in a different direction but in the end John McLaughlin formed the Mavish Doctrine and he goes down that avenue so it's interesting to hear them back together now um, I'm not sh sure when this album was recorded in terms of the month but um, in 1978 Larry Young was not well and I, he died in 1978 I don't know whether this was recorded when he was ill I don't know whether it was recorded after he died I don't know whether um, the intention was to get Larry Young in on that recording that would have been an incredible thing on Are You The One, this is a very funky track, everybody solos, the arrangement is very fluid, Jack Bruce solos, Tony Williams solos, and John McLaughlin solos to an envelope filter, he gets this sort of um, triggered wah sound, and he plays with that, the, dyna da the dynamics of that. This solo is at once funky and exploratory, and... Um, 
there is a magic between John McLaughlin and uh, Tony Williams that um, we could hear in Lifetime. Um, he also hooked up within in the infamous trio of Doom Band, which um, at the time was seen as a bit of a disaster. As time's gone on, people are now um, talking about that band in, in, in a different way. You know, this was an incredible band that was formed around about this time um, for the um, Havana Jam which is a big music festival that was going on and it featured Tony Williams on drums, John, McLa John McLaughlin on guitar and uh, Jaco Pastorius on bass, an incredible lineup. and this is all around that period. Um, I'm a big fan of John McLaughlin's guitar playing in the late 70s. Um, I've always felt that the Mavish Duxture is a massive statement but if you really want to understand John as an electric guitar player, you need to get into the um, later 70s album. And this album, Electric Guitar, is from which this track comes, is a brilliant example of John's electric guitar playing. And there's a number of incredible solos on here. But I just feel that on Are You The One, he does something that um, you don't hear him do that often. It's still explore exploratory, it's still out there, but there's a funkiness and a and um, a virtuosity in his rhythmical placement of the notes is quite incredible. So that's what I've got at number 10. Right, at number nine, I have a strange choice. Um, in the early 90s, there was a tribute album came out to Jimi Hendrix called um, In From The Storm. It had a whole host of incredible players on it. I think Bootsy Collins on there. I think Tony Williams is on there. And John McLaughlin's on there in an incredible band. And this band is John McLaughlin guitar, Vinnie Colaiuto on drums, and Sting on bass and vocals. And they do a version of the Hendrix track, Wind Cries Mary. And when it gets to the guitar solo, John does that leaving planet Earth thing that we love so much. Um, he's playing through, uh, I think, sort of some sort of envelope filter, frequency shifter, something that he, he, he does every now and then. I absolutely love it. Um, it's wonderful to hear the plaintive vocal of Sting in this beautiful tune and then suddenly hear this virtuoso band just open up and John head for the, you know, horizon with his guitar playing. And um, I, I've read uh, people review this and a lot of people hate this guitar so I think it's absolutely wonderful. And um, we don't hear so much that sort of Typhoon John, you know, that sort of um, exploratory out there beyond Hendrix. And I think the fact that he's playing the Hendrix um, tune, and of course John met Jimi Hendrix when he arrived in New York in 1969, and he was invited to a session that is out there on the internet. Um, it's nothing to really get excited about, uh, the thought of Jimmy and John together. Jimmy's playing great on it. It's not well recorded, uh, but Jimmy's playing great. John's got, I think he's playing like an acoustic guitar with an electric pickup and he's just barely audible. I think that guitar must have just been feeding it back throughout the session. But there's a very strong connection between John McLaughlin and Jimi Hendrix. And I think Jimmy played a very important role in the development of the Mavish Nuxtra. And this is a beautiful example of 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 John invoking the spirit of Jimmy. So that's what I've got at number nine. It's the Wind Cries Mary off the Hendrix tribute album In From The Storm. At number eight, I have Acid Jazz off the Live In Paris album that was recorded around about 1998, I would have thought. I'm not too sure the date. Um, in the 80s, after John McLaughlin had... had um, shut down this, the third incarnation of the Mavish Orchestra, which is a very strange incarnation. Um, he then goes down the acoustic route. And there was many years where um, John was really exploring the acoustic guitar. Um, in the 90s, he returned to electric guitar with a trio that featured Dennis Chambers and the late, great Joey DeFrancesco on Hammond organ, a sort of retread of Tony Williams' lifetime, almost. And then he went to the full-on fusion with a band called Heart of Things. And that style of playing fusion has remained to this day. John's played in that sort of group form and the Heart of Things band has slowly morphed into his band that he has now. Um, so it was very exciting when John um, returned to electric guitar fusion. And when I bought the first Heart of Things album, I, I, I thought it was great. But John didn't really play that much on there. I, 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 I was a little bit let down. They were, they, I was expecting the Mavish Nuxtra didn't get it. 
They then recorded a live album called Live in Paris. It was recorded in the Seagal um, in Paris. I remember that because I actually played there about a year later. And I remember walking in, when I walked on the stage, I'd got that album and I thought, this is where they recorded that album. Um, when they do the track Acid Jazz on that live album, towards the end, um, John and Dennis Chambers do that thing that he used to do in the Mavish Nordstrup and that he got from Coltrane and Elvin Jones, which is where you kill the backing and you just go for it, drums and lead instruments. Uh, this is a thing that we love and I'm sure there's going to be a number of examples on this list of John doing that. Drums and guitar. Um, and it's highly exploratory. John's got an incredible distorted tone. I think he's using the like frequency shifter envelope filter, sort of a ring modulator. That was the word I was looking for. It's, it's an incredibly dirty tone. Um, the telepathy between Dennis Chambers, who's an incredible sort of machine-like drummer in the sort of Billy Cobham mold, but he's got his own thing going on. And the way they marry up is absolutely incredible. This is one of the great later stage recordings by John where he really starts to explore the dirt, when he really starts to explore the chaos, which I think he is such an incredible guitarist at, um, at, at, at sort of... Uh, uh, of he is such a great guitarist to actually um, being able to put the idea of chaos on record, you know. And I think there's something that um, puts him aside from all the other fusion guys, which is always, you feel that a lot of fusion bands are very treading very carefully and they're very considered about making sure everything is in just the right place. And John's not like that. He always says that he, when he plays, he's always trying to you know, end up with there being some blood on the stage. And this is one of those examples. So that is what I've got at number eight, is Acid Jazz. Um, off the album Live in Paris by the Heart of Things Band. Number seven, I have got an, another guitar solo that starts off as a sort of drum and um, guitar open solo. And it's the track On the Way Home to Earth, which is the final track on the greatest album ever made, Visions of the Emerald Beyond. Uh, this starts off in the same thing with Narada Michael Old this time and John pitted against each other. John's got the old um, ring modulator on and he's doing all that thing. But the thing that's incredible with this, this track is as, as this track develops, you become aware of what almost feels like a full orchestra. It's like, it's like we're, we're in the realm of chaos and then suddenly heaven emerges behind and John's guitar transforms from being uh, you know in this almost like state of pain of anguish to this sort of revelatory I I can say it this revelatory um sort of heavenly upward looking with these incredible thick distorted notes just singing out while this huge orchestral backing moves through this sort of um, expressionist harmonic structure. It's an incredible moment in music and it's um, a fitting climax to an incredible album. Um, I feel that John has certain empathy with drummers. Billy Cobb is one, uh, Dennis Chambers would be one, Tony Williams is one and Narada Michael Walden is one. Drummers are very important to um, John and I feel that for me John McLaughlin full out post Hendrix aiming for the heavens anguish you know angst all that stuff he's at his best when Narada was with him Narada seems to have this explosive exuberance on the drums that just seems to chime in with John and I think um once John had laid the groundwork um, with the Mavish Doctor with Billy Cobham, when Narada came in, he comes at the, at the age of 19, a virtuoso drummer, he's ready, but he was trained. And I think he went through an experience where at a young age, he was focused by John himself so that you get this sort of unification between the drums and the guitar. It's quite an incredible performance. Um, equally incredible is another track uh, with Nora Michael Walden on, which comes from the last um, album by the second Mavish Nocturne, which is called Inner Worlds. In fact, I think there's a copy on the shelf behind me. Uh, the second track that, on that album is a track that really 
splits Mahavishnu Fangs. There's a track called Miles Out. And on that, um, it's a jam between Narada Michael Walden and John. Again, he's in that screaming, ring modulating, and he's got this effect on guitar. I don't know what it is, but it seems to, every time he presses it, it seems to tip the guitar into a fourth dimension or something. It's quite incredible. It's just Narada and, and, and John jamming. They have like a sequence bass line. <laughs> right. And John starts with some of that funky guitar play that you don't often hear, this funky sort of hyper James Brown rhythm guitar. And then as he kicks in, you just feel the whole thing explode and lift off <laughs> into space, you know. Inner Worlds is a, is, is a great album, but it's, it's, it's unlike the other Mavish Orchestra albums. It's, it, Narada Michael Walden is far more involved, and I love Narada's music, but it's a Narada Michael Walden album. Um, there's some incredible guitar playing on there, but you could tell the band, it, it almost feels like this album's contractual, they're, they're having to make an album. They're in a very expensive studio, they're at the peak in terms of their commercial appeal, the record company spent a ton of money on them, and so the production is incredible. And uh, I think it was, it was, um, it was recorded in that honky tonk chateau where Elton John recorded that album. And the thought of Narda and uh, John sat in some ornate sort of, you know, ballrooms in, in outside Paris somewhere, uh, playing this music is, an, is, is a delight. It's, for me, it's the high point of the album. It's a mind blown track. But because it, this is probably John at his most avant garde and out there, John. Um, before the Mavish Nocturne, did a lot of work in free jazz. And I don't know whether you'd call this free jazz, it seems to be even beyond free jazz, you know. You have that funk in there, you've got that sequence bass line that sounds almost like sort of disco, but the, the relationship between the drums and the guitar is absolutely mind-blowing. So I've tried my best to explain why I love Miles Out so much. I know a lot of people hate it, but that's why I got number six anyway. At number five, I have, from the original Mavish Nuxtra, the guitar solo of Sister Andrea, which is the second track on uh, side one of the live album Between Nothingness and Eternity. Sister Andrea is not a, um, a John McLaughlin composition, it's a Jan Hammer composition. And um, it's very funky, but very Mavishnu. I, I think a lot of the sound that the Mavishnu had came from Jan Hammer. This is a theory I have and I, I think it's brought out by S Sister Andrea. Now y Jan had recorded Sister Andrea before I think with Tommy Bolin or around the same time. It's very interesting to go and hear Tommy Bolin's take on that track. It's uh, I don't know if that track was released but it's out there on the internet now. You'll find it on YouTube. But with the Mavish Nuxture, especially in a live setting, it, it, it turns into a tour de force. It's an incredible track. Jan Hammer does an incredible Moog solo on it. But at one point, the track just stops and John plays a cadenza. Now, anybody who knows the iconic um, picture of John McLaughlin with an electric guitar, he's playing a Gibson double neck guitar or he's playing that Rex Bow guitar later on. But he's got a double neck guitar and he's got a 12 string. And he used to use that 12 string for the arpeggiated parts of the Mavish Nuxtra. Um, but here, it sounds like he's soloing on the 12 string part of the guitar. And that creates a thickness and, a, and, a, and a, um, when you play a 12 string, when you hit those notes, those notes, especially the high strings, you've got two strings at the same note. But if you bend it at all, you get um, microtonic um, changes within the sound that create these little, and these little things come out. And, and, and John uses that and explores that and he opens up with this sound. It, 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 it's incredible, this cadenza. And this cadenza builds and then the band comes in and up and he just does that mavish duck string and just ascends up into heaven. You know, and once he reaches the peak, they kick back into the funky roof of Sister Andrea. It, it's um, a sublime moment from John. And it's an example of the sort of thing that would happen live with the Mavish Nuxture. You don't understand the Mavish Nuxture unless you listen to the live recordings. So that is a great place to uh, discover, you know, that sound. Um, so that is what I've got at, uh, um, at number five is Sister Andrea. So I got confused by my notes because at number four, I have another guitar solo that maybe John McLaughlin fans don't know. Um, before John played 
with the Mavish Doctor. He was playing in Tony Williams' Lifetime, but he was also joining in on a lot of sessions with Miles Davis. And these sessions are very important to the history of jazz. His uh, work on In a Silent Way and Bitches Brew is, 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 is absolutely, um, it's like a, a, a another really important milestone in the history of jazz, rock and fusion. And it's John's inclusion in that band on electric guitar that really turns the, those records into fusion records. Um, in the early 70s, they brought out an album called Big Fun, and it, it contains a lot of outtakes from the sort of Bitches Brew era. Um, on that, there's a track, which is a very long track, called Go Ahead, John. It's one of the many um, Miles Davis tracks at that time that are named after John, or refer to John in some way. And uh, I think this is a testament to how important John's sound was to Miles Davis at that point. Now, Go Ahead John is an incredible jam in a sort of bitches brew mode. The band's a little bit cut down and the whole track creates, uh, it also contains like a trumpet condenser and all sorts of different stuff. I think it's about half an hour long. But the guitar solo on that, um, Tio Macero, who was a producer, has taken that jam and it's, this to me is groundbreaking. And I, 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 I feel of all the tracks that people talk about from that era, the Jack Johnson stuff, the bitches brew, the most groundbreaking track of them all is Go Ahead John. Because not only have they jammed and then T.O.'s done that arrangement thing with, with the jams, which is a, um, an innovation he did on In a Silent Way, which predates the way we make music now, but he also treats the jam to effects. And the drums, Jack DeJohnette's drums, and Jack DeJohnette is sort of playing somewhere between James Round rhythms and Elvin Jones. And there's this sort of break beat jumping around at the beat which seems to predate like drum and bass and jungle but um it it seems like tio's puts it through some sort of splitter i don't know whether this splitter's automated or whether actually physically splitting but the drums are jumping from one channel to the next which is just really disorientated and then john seems to be mic'd up in, in with two separate mics one which is really up close and in your face and one which is really far and is full of all this sort of room sound and that guitar is also jumping between the two. And it sounds like music from the future. Even now it sounds like music from the future. And John, you know, when John's playing with um, Miles Davis at this time, his guitar solo is exploring all sorts of different ideas and areas. You know, on, in a silent way, he's actually very minimal. He's got a clean guitar sound. On Bitches Brew, he's got a clean guitar sound, but he just pushed that a little bit more. And, it, and his sound sort of winds into that, that sound of sort of like voodoo, the big ensemble sound. John's sound is a lot of funky guitar playing. Jack Johnson, he's, he's, he's um, not that much soloing by John. Um, people talk about his guitar playing on that. At the end of Sign One, he opens up into a bit of a guitar solo, um, a really distorted, fuzzy guitar solo. If you really want to hear him playing with Miles, it's go ahead, John. Here, full on distortion, full on screaming, feedback, noise, and then with Tio's effect on the guitar, it really is an incredible performance by the, the whole band. So that's what I've got at um, number four is go ahead, John, uh, off the album Big Fun. When they released the uh, complete uh, Bitches Brew or Jack Johnson's, I can't remember which one it is, I've got them all. Um, I was very excited to hear Go Ahead John and what they've got is the original jam which is fantastic but they didn't put on this version and so this track doesn't seem to have really um, had its place in jazz rock history but it should be there it really should anyway um, we're now that back to we're down to the last three now so at number three I have from the album Electric Dreams, which came out about 1979, which was by a group he had called the One Truth Band, is the tune Dark Prince. Now, Dark Prince is this sort of post-Giant Steps, incredibly fast jazz piece with incredible chord changes. If you really want to hear John McLaughlin at his most virtuoso, this is the track. And it still retains that hysterical sort of um, aiming at the horizon sound of John. He, he is off the scale on this track. And the way he negotiates these chord changes is, is absolutely incredible. I really think that John's got his own way 
of, of navigating through a complex chord changes. He doesn't go for the chord scale thing. He doesn't go for the sort of bebop thing. And, and he doesn't go for the Ornette Coleman thing, you know. He, he has got his own way of doing it, and it is very chromatic. And uh, it's very non-arpeggio based, and you can hear there's scales there. But the way he works his way through these chords, and the speed he does it, and the facility and the picking, it's absolutely jaw-dropping. The band, the, the One Truth band, which were around the late 70s, which um, contained uh, Fernando Sordas on bass, the incredible Stu Goldberg, who does an incredible Moog solo on this track, uh, Tony Smith on drums, and uh, El Shanker on violin, although he's not on this track. That band, check out some of the live recordings of that, because for me that was also equal to the Mavish Nocturne, and John is at his peak in terms of electric guitar playing, and we can hear it on this track. So that's what I have at number three, is the Dark Prince off the um, Electric Dreams album by the One Truth Band. At number two, we have the solo that, for me, launched my love. It's at number two, it nearly made number one, and that is the guitar solo off Birds of Fire. Um, when I uh, got into the Mavish Nocturne, um, I, uh, the first album I heard by John or the Mavish Nocturne was Birds of Fire. First track I heard was um, One Word. I put the second side on first by accident. And that group solo thing that spins out control, I was like, oh, what is this? This is incredible. But I turn it over to side one. I think I did that next. And Birds of Fire comes on and you get this ominous gong. It's like this, I've got one here. <laughs> Anyone who knows their Mavish, what's about to come in now? That, 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 that incredible arpeggiated riff in 18-8, absolutely incredible. And then Cobham's drums come in, da, 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 and then they go into this unison melody between Jerry Goodman's incredible biting violin and John's you know, incredible, you know, angst-ridden guitar and that Moog, and this, this was the first time anyone would have heard a Moog played like that, and the, you know, because Hammer is really pioneering this way of playing. And we get that staple of the Mavish Nuxture, which is this sort of stop-start melody um, between all the instruments. Uh, it's not quite lined up, they're not going for, like, precision, they're going for emotion. And then as, as, as Cobham is sort of playing this sort of 9-8 groove against the 18 with the double bass drums going, to all in, no one's ever heard anything like this before. John goes into this guitar solo. And for me, it's one of his most gut-wrenching emotional solos. And for me, at that point, when I heard that album, it expressed something that was in me. This is the solo, and this is what John does, but more than anything else, there, there is... Um, I really want to try and put into words what it makes me feel like. This is not a technical thing. John doesn't play fast particularly. There's a sort of little bit of a fast run on there. It's much more about the tone and the bends. And it's like the blues. It's like the blues, but it's not the blues. It's, it's the blues that has been channeled into a different direction. Because um, it, it's like Indian music and it's like John Coltrane all at the same time. And John seems to be pulling on something from himself, which it's like the soul in torment trying to find some sort of, you know, balance. It's, it's, it's at once spiritual and terrifying. Um, it's the guitar solo that changed my life. Um, when I heard that, I no longer wanted to play with super precision on guitar. I've never been interested in that sort of guitar playing. I like guitaring to have all that, you know, grit and gunk, you know, an emotional um, waste. <laughs> you know, I want to. I want to hear. I want to hear the soul expressed, and that's what John does there. Anyone who says John McLaughlin is just a technician, they absolutely don't understand it, right? And they should need to go back to their Dave Gilmore guitar solos or their Andy Latimer guitar solos or whoever it is that they think, you know, nice tasteful stuff that makes you feel all relaxed and you can appreciate, the, you know, the beauty. That's not what John does. John is there and he's going to try and lift you to a different place. So at number one, we have 
It's my favourite Mavish Nuxia track. When I did my favourite Mavish Nuxia tracks, this came out at number one. I think it does everything that the Mavish Nuxia does, does everything that John McLaughlin ever did. It, it, it's a huge statement. Again, it's off Visions of the Emerald Beyond. I've, I've picked two tracks off there, and if I was not careful, I could have picked even more, because all the guitar playing on that is just John at his best. But the track is Lila's Dance. Lila's Dance opens up with that sort of dance of Maya. Now, if there wasn't, if there wasn't a, a Lila's Dance... I would have put Dance of Meyer on this list. That guitar solo is incredible. And it's that sort of slow 6-8 blues, but with it, that little um, bar of 2-8 at the end, which sort of puts you into sort of 28, you know. And so we got this timing. Um, but when the track opens up, it's much more in the sort of Birds of Fire territory. We have one of those ar arpeggiated guitar things. Um, John at Ponte comes in with this violin solo, which is unbelievable. It's like just heavenly. Right, and the whole thing is ethereal and vast and orchestral and, and you feel like you've been elevated to another plane. And then suddenly the band drops down and we get that blues chug. That's so we got we got this weird blues, which is all broken up, it's not quite right. I think this is one of the great geniuses of John to be able to take the blues to this place. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, da da, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, one. And then Nada comes in. Do 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 bang kabam. And then John kicks in with a guitar solo that is just it, it's like birds of fire. It's just so wrenchy and like so emotional. But at the same time, this one goes further down into the blues. It's screaming and, the, it, and, and it's so dirty and gutsy. And the production's incredible. And again, like Narada and, and, and John together, it's just such an incredible emotional experience. And then the composition seems to somehow unify that floaty heavenly thing and then this gutsy, dirty streets blues thing. And it puts those two things together. The two themes sort of come across. The, the, the first part is in five. The second part is in 20. And those two things relate and you get these two things together, which for me is the definition of the sublime. Chaos and order in perfect balance. And when you balance those things, you go to a sublime place. And what exists in that sublime place? The infinite. It's the thing that some people call God and other people call the material universe in its totality. But whatever you want to call it, whatever exists, exists at the end of that tune. Oh, God. I'll put a lot into this video, haven't I? Love. I'll put a lot into this video. I hope you appreciate it. Right. Got to the end of the video. That was my 10 greatest guitar solos or ten greatest electric guitar solos by John McLaughlin, my favourite musician of all time, uh, ranked 10 to 1. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, pop a like onto uh, this video. And if you want to uh, see more, you can subscribe. Come on, I, I, I want to get my subscriptions up. I'm a, what am I, 17,000 at the moment? I want to get to 20,000. One day I'm going to have 100,000 and YouTube will send me one of those silver things, you know, the silver YouTube plaques. That's all I want out of life now. I don't want anything else. I want to be able to put it in the back there and feel like I achieved something because I've got one of those silver plaques in the background. You know, some people are getting those just for like laughing at TikTok videos. Here I am sweating trying to explain the deep spiritual and aesthetic qualities of this music to you with all this stuff going on. I'm going to have to have a lie down about this. So come on. Press subscribe, right? If you don't like this, don't. But if you like what I'm doing, I'm only going to do more of it. So press subscribe and ring the notification bell. Now, if you really like what I'm doing, you want to support me and come and join the Andy Edwards Club, which is the best club in the world, by the way, you can click on Patreon and come and join us over there. It's a right laugh and it's 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 really turning into something my patron is. There's all sorts of different things going on. I'm not even going to tell you. Go and have a look. Click on the Patreon. You don't have to pay to have a look. Right, you can go and have a look and see what sort of stuff's up there. And if you like, if you like the look of it, then um, there's a ton of stuff up there. I tell you, there's a lot of stuff there. I love Patreon. Uh, but if Patreon's not for you because you haven't got the time to sit there going through all that stuff, and you know it'd be a waste of money. But you do want to support me in a sort of very generous, you know, way. You can stick some money in my PayPal tip jar and. Uh, you know, quite a few people have done that recently and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I can't say much about what's going on in my personal life at the moment, but I am going through 
something and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that being there at the moment and if the more I can do this full time the, the, the better it would be for the world basically so you know if you want to make the world a better place then support me and do my YouTube oh what it is to have a big ego it's wonderful <laughs> Shall we, rec shall we recreate it? Come on, I'll try my best. I didn't plan to do this, but I do have a guitar here. I'll try my best. I haven't played this for a while. Oh, you know, at the end of my videos, it all goes awry. <laughs> so I now, I'm going to recreate without any thought or practice the opening to Birds of Fire for you and then it will fade out once I get into it that'll be the end of the video and then we're done okay so here we go oh I've cocked up already I can't even hit the thing right and you know what put me off then is the first one is quieter than the second one isn't it so let's try it again take two let's have a go at this come on then now that's too quiet, come on, you're just hitting this, come on. I hit that one then, didn't I? That sport, I hit another one at the same time. Let's just try, try again. Bye. Uh -huh.